Our commencement speaker is uniquely qualified to address this class, in fact, any class at the CEU. Like the founder of this university, her roots are here in Hungary. But like the founder, she has experienced involuntary exile. The daughter of two very distinguished journalists, she came to the United States out of Hungary in the wake of the revolution of 1956. Her parents bravely reported that revolution. And she went into her parents' business, become a distinguished journalist, both in print and on television, on NPR and ABC. She, in the United States, became an author of great distinction, writing a book about a group of emigres from Hungary that changed the world, a fabulous memoir of her own life and her parents, where she discovered not only her own displacement and the displacement of her parents, but her grandparents, having discovered that they were Jews killed in Auschwitz and she had been brought up as a Roman Catholic. Very few of us understand the values of open society because very few of us are forced to leave our homes, discover that we're not wanted by the place we once felt was our own, and had to enter the world in a way homeless, abandoned. Conti Martin in the United States became a central figure in American politics and journalism. And she, with her late husband Richard Holbrook, came, became a powerful force on behalf of human rights and human justice. Educated at the Sorbonne at the Institut d'Etudes uh, Politiques, uh, she has been active not only in journalism but in the writing of history, writing as well about the conflict and the origins of the conflict in the Middle East. So it is with great respect and admiration that I present to you the newest member of our Board of Trustees at CEU, the distinguished author and writer, Kati Martin. Thank you so much, Leon. Congratulations, class of 2011, and your parents too. I know this was a joint effort. George, what a, what a legacy you have left us. What a remarkable sight this is, looking out at you. John Shattuck, thank you for your dynamic leadership, and you have the perfect voice to be the graduation speaker. <laughs> I, I am so honored on, on my husband's behalf. He would be doubly honored to share this award with his friend and colleague, Javier Solana. This is a, a great day for, for both of us. And my first graduation present to you is that while I was sitting up there, I decided to cut my speech in half. <laughs> so, I know, I know you, you've got your diplomas and, and, uh, and let the partying begin, and I want to join you in that. So let, but let me just first share a few lessons that I learned on the front lines of history with Richard Holbrook during the past 17 years. Richard believed in the primary importance of American values. American values as a force for good in the world. He was what you might call a muscular liberal. He wanted American power to stand for American decency. He never let bureaucracies nor process to hinder his goal. He thought that it was okay to step on some pretty big toes if lives were at stake. His brand of diplomacy had a human face. It was built on trust and respect not on assertion of power. But if that failed, he wouldn't hesitate to summon power. He felt that the only way to break down barriers is by sitting face to face, human to human, with your bitterest foe. And that's what he did in the Balkans. When he was given his last mission, Afghanistan, Pakistan, he insisted that the presidents of Afghanistan and Pakistan travel to Washington together and attend all meetings together. Once you know your adversary, it's much harder to demonize him. 
He liked to say that diplomacy was like jazz. You improvise as you go along, always keeping your goal very clear and using every available tool that you can summon to achieve your goal. If he thought I could be useful, he used me. <laughs> and I was happy to be used. <laughs> One of my favorite poets, Yeats, once said that education is not a pail, but the lighting of a fire. Certainly a fire burned brightly in Richard until the last. He did not waste any time, and neither must you. Here in one of the world's great cities, walking its history-soaked streets these past years, Budapest, your teachers, and your fellow students have surely lit a fire within you. Be fearless now as you go on to the next chapter. Remember, every original idea seems crazy at the beginning. Be original and trust your instincts and don't take no for an answer. Especially if the no is followed by, well, that's not the way we do business around here. That's what Richard was told when he tried to get the European powers to break the deadly siege of Sarajevo. Yes, by using force as a last resort, or later, at the United Nations, when he pushed the Security Council to deal with the worldwide AIDS epidemic. We don't deal with health issues on the Security Council, he was told. He prevailed by never giving up and never getting discouraged. The audacity of determination could well be the title of his biography. And maybe someday yours. There's no sadder sight, Mark Twain once said, than a young pessimist. Pessimists do not change the world. They don't think it's worth the trouble, but you can. For a number of years, I fought for journalist rights as the only real safeguard against demagogues and dictators. Whether in the Middle East or in Central Europe, you simply cannot build a genuine democracy without a free and responsible press, empowered to rigorously investigate politicians, government officials, and businessmen. It's that simple. Please note that I use the word responsible when describing the press. Comment is free, but facts are sacred. A very famous British editor once said that. It is the bravest of the brave who are under fire, from Damascus to Tehran, reporters risking all to keep us informed, and it is for them that I make interventions through my work at the Committee to Protect Journalists. I do this partly because there was no such organization when the Hungarian secret police arrested my mother and father and sentenced them to long prison terms merely for the crime of being good reporters. Then, as now, facts upset dictators. They can even upset countries whose self-image can clash with the truth. I recall how upset we Americans were by the images of torture at American hands in Abu Ghraib. My parents went to prison fighting for the right to report facts just a few decades ago. In Europe, we have a great tendency to forget too soon. That's a mistake. Only history puts events in perspective. People die, history does not. For the first time in 2,500 years, most Europeans live in liberal democracies. For the first time, European nations do not ask their citizens to die for their countries. When I first returned to this city, two decades after my family was forced to flee, my Hungarian friends and I lived in different worlds. Today, we share the same world. Our children are indistinguishable from each other in appearance and in their aspirations. And this is a wonderful thing. But let us not lose sight of the people, our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents who paid the highest price so that we could live to enjoy this wonderful day together in Budapest. In my books, I try to connect today's world with our recent history as a sort of warning bell. Intolerance on this continent is ever-present and ever-dangerous. At the same time, 
A determined man or woman can achieve remarkable things. My husband did. In my book on Raoul Wallenberg, the first book I ever wrote, Wallenberg was the hero of Budapest, I focus on the difference that another such man made in standing up to the hate mongers. Wallenberg, like Richard, also stood up to those two cautious bureaucrats who in their way can also lead millions to their death by blindly following inhumane policies. In my most recent work, Enemies of the People, I burrowed into the archives of the communist secret police to reveal how ordinary, decent citizens can be turned into tools of a terror state by the most powerful of all weapons, fear. Facts are the most potent of all weapons, and dictators know that. Look at how the Iranian demagogue Ahmadinejad freely distorts history, denies the Holocaust, and how devastating that would be in the absence of documentation to prove that he's a fabricator. National identity is a beautiful thing. I still get a lump in my throat when I hear the haunting sound of Ishten Alj Mega Magyart, Hungary's beautiful national anthem. But national identity cannot be a weapon of exclusion in our global village. In the age of a Europe without borders, the internet, instant messaging, and Facebook, it is unimaginable to isolate one people, one nation from any other. I'm looking at you, a student body of over 100 nationalities. Friends you made here will be your friends for life. You are strangers no more. The world is your neighborhood. Einstein once said that there are two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. Thank you so much for allowing me to share this day with you. Now please go out there and make a difference. Thank you. <laughs>